Of that first meeting, I can remember neither joy nor pain, nor anything that I can name. I had been carried suddenly to too great a height. My soul had come in contact with the divine spirit, and this force, so pure, so holy, so mighty, had overwhelmed me. He spoke to each one of us in turn of ourselves and our lives and those whom we loved. And although his words were so few and so simple, they breathed the spirit of life to our souls. People flocked to his presence in ever-increasing numbers, a great search of humanity for guidance, for happiness, for peace and assurance amidst the troublous conditions of the world. And none came in vain. The combined impression of his presence and his words was profound. One newspaper later pictured the moving scene, the crowd, Abdu'l-Baha, a serene, majestic figure, calm, commanding, austere, and wise. His audience was held in a spell of wonder and amazement. Even when Abdu'l-Baha had finished speaking, the people would not go and lingered on, asking question after question, so satisfied and tranquilized by his replies that many of them followed him later to his room. Many glanced at his mighty prophetic figure with wonder and traces of unconscious respect and went their way, never, never to be the same again. The light of his glance had fallen on them. The warmth and power of his spirit had, for a fraction of time, surrounded them in their daily rounds, their common destiny. Oh, here's my friend, the portrait painter, Juliet Thompson. She met Abdu'l-Baha in Akka, then France, and later in America. Juliet, would you please share some of your memories of the master? If I could only picture to you Abdu'l-Baha in the West, Abdu'l-Baha with the power of his peace in the restless West, Abdu'l-Baha in the complex West with his simplicity, Abdu'l-Baha with his noble and illumined beauty in the artificial and skeptical West, so strongly defined in his completeness against our underdevelopment. And that illumined beauty, that dignity, not of this world, that majesty of spirit that marks him a king among men, never went unheeded, for wherever he passed, eyes turned to follow, and the crowds, with involuntary reverence, stood back. One drive in France I shall never forget. Sitting opposite Abdu'l-Baha in the carriage, I saw him in a way I should like to leave to the future, were it possible for me to express it. His powerful head vividly defined against the most sublime of backgrounds, for those near mountains of the Alps were his background, perfect symbol of mystery. For at last we saw divinity incarnate in Abdu'l-Baha irradiated by smiles and a lifting of those eyes filled with glory which even Leonardo, for all his mystery, could not have painted. As he walked among the people, an immortal in less than human world, with his ineffable beauty, his scintillating power, his strange unearthly majesty, eyes full of wonder followed him. The poet Khalil Gibran said, for the first time I saw form noble enough to be the receptacle for the Holy Spirit. 
an atheist went to a church to hear him speak and later eagerly sought him at his house. When he was asked, did you feel the greatness of Abdul Baha? He indignantly replied, would you feel the greatness of Niagara? But those who met him perceived no more than their capacity could register. A society woman exclaimed, such beauty, the, the beauty of strength and such charm, why he is a perfect man of the world. And another society woman said, you can hide nothing from him. He looked into my heart and discovered all its secrets. A woman in sorrow passing through a cruel experience said, he took all the bitterness out of my heart. A famous playwright, when he came from the room of Abdul Baha declared, I have been in the presence of God. The Turkish ambassador Zia Pasha toasted him as the light of the age who has come to spread his glory and perfection among us. But really, words fail when any of us attempt to describe him. Oh, here is Mary Hanford Ford, an author and suffragette who was with the master in France, England, and America. Please give us your description, Mary. Abdul Baha is, above all things, an apostle of democracy. <laughs> He loves a man for the spirit within him, not for the gifts of fortune he happens to possess, and frequently he honors more those who the world esteems least. No one who saw him in England f can forget his sorrow when a poor man was accidentally refused entrance to his house, nor the great pity that possessed him at the sight of the poverty of an English village. He went to the postmaster, who was also the banker, and changed all his gold pieces into sixpences, so that he might comfort the hungry-looking children who followed him everywhere and who treasured his gentle words and caresses even more than the sixpences. Abdul Baha is like a great magnet drawing together the noblest forces of nations and individuals and his cohering power is enormous. He focalizes the temperament of every listener. Well, the stimulus of his presence in this way is something quite indescribable. It must be experienced to be comprehended. But if one did not understand Persian or French, the electric contact with Abdul Baha and his marvelous and poetic utterance would be sufficient to transform materialism into spiritual possibility. The effect of this electric presence was that of clear and prodigious thinking, which swept away like cobwebs all trivialities of sect and disunion, and pierced through to the divine harmonies which unite one to God and his neighbor. Everyone who listened to Abdul Baha must have realized that this was no sectarian founder of a cult. This was a spiritually endowed messenger whose message touched all mankind, who came out of prison to remind men of the mighty lessons God had spoken, to lift us out of barbarism and cruelty from war to peace and that in this day we must follow even the letter of these heavenly lessons. There is something singularly inspiring about the presence of Abdul Baha. He so forcefully radiates faith in God and belief in mankind's power to do the square thing in all directions and make a better world, that in spite of oneself, pessimism disappears at his advent and is replaced by courage and the joy of life. Many persons came first to his receptions out of curiosity, but returned again, and as they reappeared, 
Their faces had lost the worn, hunted, worried look of modern life. They dropped their feeling of class consciousness, discussed the events of the day with anyone who happened to be present, even if that someone wore a shabby coat or a dark face, and broadened into vivid sympathy with the positive unity of the prevailing atmosphere. <laughs> this uplift he inspires is, of course, Abdu'l-Bahá's peculiar charm. <laughs> no one who comes into contact with him fails to experience it. All leave the interview idealists hopeful of the future, earnestly determined to make a better world and do one's part in it. Sometimes his address was very short, but always his presence was so stimulating that no one had the slightest consciousness of disappointment when he arose and left the room. I wish you all could experience this. Now look, I see our dear friend Sarah Farmer has come to share something of her experience with the master. You know, she has the conference center in Elliott, Maine, they call Green Acre. What a place. Welcome, Sarah. The greatest confirmation of my life has been my connection to the master, Abdu'l-Bahá. How thrilled I was to meet him in the Holy Land when I thought I was just on a trip to Egypt. I wrote down numerous questions for him to answer and put them in my Bible, but I was summoned to meet him very early the next morning, and I forgot to take my questions to the meeting. Can you imagine my surprise when he began answering my questions through the interpreter without any questions being asked at all? and in the order they were written. He answered them all, and he confirmed my vision for Green Acre and said that it would become a great center, bringing together East and West, Black and White, rich and poor, and so it has. But even when things seem most bleak, I would receive guidance. Abdu'l-Bahá has written me 28 letters, consoling me, at my darkest times. His letters always arrive when I most need them. O maidservant of God, be not disheartened if thou hearest the murmuring of the deniers. Withstand their oppositions with cheerfulness and exaltation. Be thou a light to every darkness, a dispeller of every sadness, a healer for every sick person, a quencher for every thirst, a shelter for every refugee, a refuge for every captive. Trust in the grace of thy Lord. He shall surely assist thee with a confirmation whereat minds will be amazed and the thoughts of the men of learning will be astonished. Men of learning astonished by me? He gave such confirmations to all of us and allowed us to see a new vision of gender and racial equality. Uh, here's a precious passage. As to the people of color, verily the faces of these are as the pupil of the eye. Although the pupil is created black, yet it is the source of light. I hope these black ones will be the glory of the white ones. You see, I've been right to proclaim the unity of race, despite the resistance and opposition from so many. Abdu'l-Bahá has helped me to see that my visualization of all people mingling together will come to pass regardless of their station in life, their race, their religion or gender. That will create the necessary conditions for world peace. Now listen to what he says about women. O maidservant of God, know that every true woman who is attracted by the fragrances of holiness in this most glorious age will surpass even the most developed men of previous centuries. 
I hope that thou wilt become the lamp of the Society of Green Acre and wilt become the envy of the queens of all regions and wilt be the rival of all the celebrated people of the world. The envy of queens? The rival of celebrated people, I can't quite imagine it. He also says, when the equality of men and women is realized, the foundations of war will be utterly destroyed. Assuredly, woman will abolish warfare among mankind. So you see, he gives us a vision of the transformation of humanity and of the inevitability of world peace. We just need to follow his example and his directives. He came to Green Acre. Those were heavenly days and I was devastated when he left. But he promised us that when we are in unity, we will find him in our midst. So that is our greatest consolation and confirmation. The master tells us, I am with you always. I am with you always.